Hello, everybody. Um, so excited to meet the community of readers here on Bloomsbury India today. Uh, my name is Ritu Parna, and I'm the author of The Water Phoenix. It's a memoir about uh, childhood abuse, healing, and forgiveness. Um, and uh, happy World Book Day to you. Thank you for joining me here today as I discuss my book with you. Uh, now, before I begin, I wanted to just uh, share a few stats with you. Um, in India, which is, well, we don't need to talk about the population there, but one in five girls and one in 20 boys is uh, sexually abused. So, and this is like a few years ago. And we know those are not even all the reported stats. And uh, therefore, I think this um, story of what happens to children who grow up being abused is a very important one. It's quite different from the Me Too movement because those are still adults who have um, come out and it's, it's so, so important. But with children, when you grow up being abused, um, you don't know your identity, you don't know who you are, and very often the abusers are uh, somebody we know. So, um, you know, what mm -hmm. does it mean? Do I trust this person? Do I not trust this person uh, who is, you know, uh, abusing me one minute and then is the kindest person mm -hmm. and who's giving me uh, gifts and all of that the next. So um, this book deals with the inner life of those children who look completely fine on the outside. The signs are always there. But I think as a, as a society, as grown-ups, we are not uh, equipped to really note them, to really notice them that openly. For example, I think in girls, especially UTIs are uh, very common signs, but again, abuse is a whole spectrum. And more than anything else, it's about um, emotional abuse. We think um, that sexual abuse is the highest form. It is definitely huge, but it's a manifestation of emotional abuse because um, it's a boundary that has gone. And uh, that's what this book deals uh, with, you know, what, what happens to these uh, to these children when every single boundary that you have, uh, every single preference that you have, you don't know, is it coming from you or is it a reaction? And then, um, you know, throughout my life, I think close to 50 people have shared their stories with me. And it's amazing how it continues to impact uh, their relationships today their, uh, how they show up in their friendships, how they show up at work, their relationship with themselves, they don't feel safe. And uh, many of them are not aware that this goes back to childhood. And childhood never really ends. And I don't think uh, each of us is one child. There are many inner children in each one of us. So again, the water phoenix deals with uh, the, you know, the, the voices of all these inner children that live in me. And uh, and in many ways, in, in all of us. Um, so that is one thing. And uh, another reason how this book happened was um, one of those more you know more interesting questions that I uh, love to ask, and also you know people ask in conversations is, "What is your earliest memory?" And it's fascinating to me how little most people, not everybody, but most people remember of their younger years. Uh, they're like, oh, I don't remember much of my childhood or, you know, they remember, okay, I was on my tricycle. Um, and that's great. But if we go back and back, we can actually remember all the way uh, till, I don't know, we were even a few months old. Um, anyway, so the water phoenix was one of my um, earliest memories. And uh, some of you know I do watercolors as well. So here is a picture. Uh, that is what the first chapter is about. And it's uh, fascinating to me how every single child who has looked at this picture uh, says that this is them. But anyway, so um, today I'm going to uh, read a few excerpts to you. And uh, we'll start with something about this picture. Uh, because of the nature of this book, because it's, uh, we'll, we'll find out, it's uh, a growing up book. I cannot reveal also, I cannot read like a whole chapter to you, but I will be able to uh, 
read bits and pieces. So we will start with uh, chapter one, the people tree. It is the tree of death, said Manga Kaka. I found this strange coming from a man who dressed in what I was taught to see as a color of death, white from head, in a white Nehru cap, to toe, in white Hawaii slippers. The tall people tree in my garden did look different with its warty wooden drippings, its mysterious dreadlocks, and its time-defying cobwebs, but I never found it spooky. It was simply not of this world, and yet it seemed that grown-ups were slightly afraid of it. Especially on nights like these, when thunderstorms raged and lightning danced furiously across the purple-black night sky my tree climbed into. Manga Kaka said she was possessed, like a churhel. I wondered how he knew that my tree was a she, leave alone a witch. I felt she was possessed too, but only with magic. Whether in a dark thunderstorm or in blinding sunshine, to me, my tree was always beautiful. Beautiful like an enchanted grandmother cat. Beautiful in a way that nothing else was in my toddler world where everything in general was fascinating. My earliest memory is of waking up in the middle of the night, oblivious to all, and looking out of my parents' bedroom window at my beloved tree, as sounds of rustling surrounded me. I was always fascinated by sounds. For instance, the word Papa birthing the sounds Papa, which is what my father taught me to call him. Even though all the other children I knew called their fathers Papa. Every time they did that, Baba, black sheep, have you any wool? sang in my ears, curling my cheeks into a smile, which the grown ups saw as sheer cuteness and gushed in vanity misplacing my joy as being for them, and not for the sound of their roll call names. They loved me instantly. Perhaps this is why they had named me Shorulipi, which meant the language of musical notes. I spent a lot of time in and around the kitchen, naturally tuning into the curry of sounds around me. As the senses of hearing and taste got mixed up, I spent hours dissecting this puzzle, pulling each flavorful sound apart. The nuttiness of coriander from the zesty warmth of ginger notes, the golden bitterness of turmeric from the comforting sounds of sugar, the fresh hot percussion of green chilies from the aggressive chant-like war cries of red chilies. On nights like these, I focused on the sounds in the front, only those the ones that were more mysterious, more alluring, trying to place them together. I might have been two and a half years old when I remember doing this. As I lounged around the house in one of my several white sleeveless cotton tape frocks that had little sparrows sewn in colorful single stitches at the hem. On most nights, my people held its own against a star-studded canvas, looking invincible. With a supernatural strength, I had yet to see a human possess. The way I felt about it then was what I was later taught to associate as feelings one has towards one's guardian angel, one's first love, one's first BFF, and one's first God. During the day, I'd spend hours listening to it, whispering secrets into its countless crevices which held ears invisible to all but me. I'd stroke its bumpy rough bark as if it was the soft fur of a giant fluffy dog. One afternoon, after I had finished my ritual of chasing homeless peacock on my way back from school, I took a sharp stone and tried to draw a picture of the sun on my people's trunk. When my tree cried slow thick white tears, I cried as well in shame apologizing profusely for having unknowingly caused it pain. I ran indoors to get first aid supplies and did a quick dressing of Pond's cold cream, a piece of cloth that I found in the kitchen, and tape. I offered it my treat for the afternoon, my first taste of kochuri, 
that my school teacher mother had brought home from a staff event safely preserved for me in the waxy white wrapper of a good day biscuit packet from the 1980s. I must have been about four years old. Old enough to learn how to cough properly into a fist, how to kiss loved ones properly by brushing lips on their cheeks as if they were made of paper and not paint them with spit like dogs were allowed to. Old enough to know that Peacock wasn't really homeless. It had to keep its address a secret to preserve its beauty. Old enough to correctly guess that it lived in the topmost part of my people tree, where the leaves were made of gold, marching into a lake of liquid golden sunlight so bright that it blinded those who dared to look. So they didn't. So it wasn't really a peacock then, was it? It was a phoenix. A phoenix who lived in the golden waters of its realm. Bored with the beauty of his world, he dropped by into ours to say hello. Year after year, the people tree kept us safe. It protected us, all of us. Nothing wrong could happen to anybody under its giant umbrella of leaves, which were as large as my frail mother's milk-white palms. They reminded me of the small beetle leaves my Jetima and Papa loved to chew on so much, and which too must therefore possess something magical for grown-ups to love it so much. Under the dark shade, the lizards who lived in the tree, the rodents who lived at its bottom, and the occasional baby goat that strayed in, and I held captive as my pet for the moment, successfully tempting it with a fibrous carcass of sugarcane cubes I had sucked the juice out of. All of us were safe. I made figurines out of twigs and sticks and left them like a devotee by her trunk. Because I had not known anything outside of it, I did not know then that this was Eden, what they called Eden, the essence of a perfect idyllic childhood. Okay. Um, all right, I'm seeing many of you uh, coming to uh, say hello. Hi to Neha, Mukti, uh, Selena, and Shivam. No, Bloomsbury is not my name. My name is Rituparna Chatterjee. Uh, hi, Vika. And um, I'm going to read another passage uh, because, like I said, this book is about various ages. So um, this is the part of the opening uh, chapter, the few opening pages. Uh, where we see how a toddler sees the world from ages one and a half to two to four. And I'm going to jump to a time when um, the person is 11 years old and uh, in boarding school. And uh, of course, feel free to ask me any questions you have. I will get back to it uh, right away. And so much of this book is about India of the late 80s and 1990s it, because uh, it, it's from all, all over India, the western parts, the big cities of Bombay and Calcutta. And uh, it's also a growing up book. It's about growing up with abuse, but at the same time growing up. And therefore, there are uh, many things which I think are best read, like a lot of things are in lists and a lot of things are um, important fact number one, number two, because... Um, I think things are a little easier for kids right now. I don't know, my kid goes to an alternative school where uh, the pressure is pretty less. But we had to make lists of a lot of things when we were growing up and we would say, you know, do you know 10 capitals? Do you, can you tell me 20 facts about this? So uh, children back then used to love to make lists. And uh, um, throughout this book, there are a lot of uh, important lessons of how what abuse does is it to a lot of children, we disassociate from our bodies and we become these observers as if life is a movie. And so you're just watching and watching and learning uh, in, in third person. It, only when you grow up and you make peace with it, you realize how messed up that is. So, um, but anyway, so uh, it, it, anyway, it, it also works in its own way. And as I read now, you uh, may see important fact number so-and-so come up and uh, life lessons. So this is a part in the boarding school. Um, in fact, two parts. I'm going to read two different shorter excerpts. So eventually the big girls couldn't take it anymore. Fueled more by the awfulness of the food than the food itself, 
they found the necessary nutrients to create history. One Sunday afternoon, they staged a spontaneous disorganized strike. They simply refused to retire up to their dorms and stayed assembled at the square with the big girl's big bell saying, we won't go until we get better food. Sister Selena and company came out immediately for this fresh, bizarre piece of entertainment. Immediately, she gathered a group of her favorite girls and commanded them sternly to move up to their dorms. They did, like lambs. Sister Superior told me, we too, go up. I was about to, like a good little lamb too, when the biggest of the big girls said, Ritu Parna, stay. I was shocked, but more thrilled and not so secretly either. She was aware of my existence? Not only aware, she even knew my name. Ritu, go up now. No, Rituparna, you stay here. Ritu, I said, go up. You stay here, Rituparna. In this power play of egos, I was a mere tennis ball looking helplessly from player to player for ownership, for security. The crowd cheered, echoing the biggest of the big girls. Stay, Ritu, stay. The very first time anybody had asked me to, while unknowingly pushing me into a swimming pool of confusion. The deep end of a swimming pool of confusion. A swimming pool outside which grew a tree with sumo wrestler palm leaves. Love and abuse were muddled up into an awful cocktail of sour juice under that tree. In my regular day-to-day -day life, I couldn't tell the two apart. And so I did not know how to process people or events. What was safe? What wasn't? Who was safe? Who wasn't? What was love? What wasn't? What was abuse? What wasn't? Who was loving? Who wasn't? What was truth? What wasn't? And so I did not know who I was, leave alone where I belonged. Um, so that was uh, one of the excerpts of how uh, what happens to kids, what's going on uh, inside them. And this is classic of uh, every kid who has been abused. We don't know who we are and we try so hard uh, to fit in, but we don't know where. Uh, and now I'll go on to uh, other passages with some uh, lessons that I learned about how to process life some more. And in the meantime, of course, after this, I will directly address your questions. If you have any questions uh, or anything about writing, anything at all, feel free to ask me. Um, okay, and thank you, Vika. Uh, thank you, Rachna. The book is a uh, different genre can relate to this book. Well, uh, this is a magic realism memoir and uh, it's, it's interesting. I believe the term magic realism is how the West likes to think of the East. And um, I think it was Haruki Murakami who said that, uh, it, who said that actually, yeah, that, you know, and, uh, that you know in tokyo he can completely uh ha you know see that there are all these whatever fairy type beings as well as robots coexisting something to the tune of that but what he meant was that it's it's something we can fathom but it's in the west which is so logical that we have to create a genre like fantasy we have to create a hardcore uh reality genre and I have never seen the world like that and children definitely do not, uh, you know, to them, imagination and reality is not that separate. And I think that is what makes this a magic realism memoir. Rachna, I hope that answers your question. Feel free to ask more. Uh, thank you, Trupti, Selena, Vita. Thank you for the kind words. So I'm going to go on to, um, and of course, all the names have been changed in this book. I had a lot of fun coming up with names. And uh, um, yeah, so I'm going to... Um, I've even changed the names of the two dogs uh, at my boarding school. This is about them. Okay. David and Goliath are rambunctious school dogs and the only monsters scary enough to frighten away the Langur gangs on campus showed solidarity in their own way. The furry black wild father-son duo fell in love with the skinny brown street, an ordinary mongrel common to every street in the country. Her ordinariness making her blend instantly into whatever landscape she found herself in. Yet, much to the collective shock of the loving nuns, Didis, spinster matrons, and us, the only time we were bound together by something, 
Daddy and Sonny had eyes for her and her only. David and Goliath thus taught me, important lesson number 21. Love was not being extraordinary, but to see the ordinary as extraordinary. Many moonlit nights saw the campus awash with the house of David and Goliath, as their two hearts pined for their one love. Finally, the loving nuns gave in, fixed the bitch, and gave her the name of Lela, led her into the campus, where the three dogs lived happily ever after until the end of their lives. So that was a lesson in love. And there's another lesson in love. Uh, this is around sixth grade. Uh, there was a girl, again, I've changed everybody's names, who had been in the sixth grade for a long time. She was very shy, very into herself. And um, year after year, she just stayed in the sixth grade. And then uh, one of her um, uh, sisters, I don't know if it was a cousin or a real, but she was much younger and she finally made it to the sixth grade. And this is about what happened then. Uh, to, to that girl whom I've called Letitia, who had been in sixth grade for many years. So. That year, Letitia passed. Everyone was happy for her, though nobody knew how this miracle happened. The answer was, as always, in plain sight. Her baby sister had finally climbed up the grades to reach the sixth standard. It was as if Letitia had been waiting for her all along. With her love and support, Letitia passed and never failed again. The sisters were together in every grade after that. They tell you that you need to be strong and fight to persevere. But what it takes to survive a storm is the very opposite, to not fight it. This gentleness is the greatest strength there is. To have someone holding your hand through the storm, well, that is all that love is. Only those who didn't have it were acutely aware of it. Okay, so um, that was that excerpt. Uh, well, thank you, Rachna. Um, wh what is my opinion about what? Uh, if you could clarify your question, I will take any other questions uh, all of you have. Um, Uh, thank you, Rachna. Yes, uh, I, I think that is right. A lot of uh, Rachna's question is, what is your opinion about sharing insights about this book with uh, kids who are growing up? I feel this book shares the storyline that lots of kids go through as they are growing up, but they are unaware how to express. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you are extremely intuitive. That is absolutely correct. I think... Um, Abuse doesn't have to be sexual. You don't have to go through a whole bunch of uh, stuff only or physical. The worst kind of abuse is actually emotional. And uh, personally, I think it's impossible the way our human race is set up and modern society for a single child to not have faced that. So yes, all of them feel this and more and more as our societies get more isolated. I'm not even talking about the social isolation right now, but generally, I think... Um, Certain excerpts can be read and uh, like this one, my kid is seven and uh, the David and Goliath part is something he knew. And there are some parts that are very light. That's how life is, you know, it's light, it's dark, it's all together. Um, I think you could read it to some of them and I do not personally think it's need to be protected. Uh, they, it, I, I think they're 14, it, it's fine, but it would be nice if they had somebody to guide them uh, through it because some of the passages are very disturbing and they tend to still be extremely uh, sensitive at, uh, during you know those younger years. So yes, if, if there is a responsible adult to guide them through, I think it's totally fine for 12 and up even, uh, but 14 at the bare minimum, I would say. Um, because I think more than anything else, this uh, book provides answers. Uh, the last section deals with how things got so bad that uh, I absolutely had to take matters into my own hands because it was affecting my everyday life as a grown-up. So, uh, yeah, there are there are actually answers and there are processes and there are also uh, lists of people you could look up. Um, there's a sea of information out there, but these are the people who, or, you know, whose processes I followed and which helped me. Uh, Vika saying you said earlier that childhood never leaves us. How true. 
what advice could you give about not only surviving trauma in childhood but how can one thrive and see beauty despite the past uh what a beautiful question thank you vika uh it is in the in the last part of the book is all about exactly the answer is everything i would be giving the book away if i say it all now but uh, well i hope you get the book and enjoy it when it comes it is important however to see the journey because uh the last part which has all the answers that's so specific to what you know materialized where and how everything shifted um but i think by default children are born to see beauty everywhere and i don't think we need to teach them very much i think it's the opposite they're here to teach us so i definitely learn every single day from my kid and i hear that from a lot of mothers too that my kids are teaching me which is uh, amazing and um thank you vika thanks so much so uh yeah i i think we just need to preserve that and not let it get lost with all the pressures and uh of you know hundreds of activities running around modern life in general is pretty stressful so long as they can hold on to that so long as they can sit with themselves be be present know that everything that comes up is okay anger is okay everything is okay so long as they can sit with themselves not act, act out of it I, i think that's a great practice uh that we could uh sit with kids and uh, grow with them in, into those so they have those as tools when they grow up and uh, i'm going to wait a minute for any other questions if there are any before um going any further Thank you so much all of you who have found this work uh, moving and beautiful you're all very kind. Thank you. Um okay I'll keep waiting if there are questions but at the same time I'll also uh, go ahead. I was asked if um oh thank you Selena. Uh Vika thank you so much. I should have found the process of this book very healing. However, I think I had already done so much uh healing work already that I don't think um this book needed to be a catharsis for me. Uh the dedication of the book is to each child that has been abused. This book is um is not as much for me because um although it is my story because like i said about close to 50 people have shared their stories with me and i see the way they are suffering how bitter some of them are and it's not their fault and they have no idea what how it happened and so i felt this was a very uh, necessary story to be told about how the body holds trauma the body itself is a is a huge character in this how the body holds trauma how it just manifests in the most inconvenient and completely random times so you can sit in therapy of course for long and if you have a good therapist that's amazing i definitely did not have any therapist i just had to uh, do everything myself um and uh, but it didn't it wasn't uh, healing for me I, like i said i already healed and this book is for others more than that um but this book is also a celebration of childhood it isn't uh, you know that's why it's a magic realism memoir it isn't as um difficult as it sounds in that way um oh uh, rachna thank you i think we i don't know myself we are all under lockdown uh i consider books an essential business they saved my life they saved the lives of so many people i know Uh, unfortunately i don't think that's what the higher powers think so i guess once all these lockdowns are over we will see uh, more books come out uh, and definitely india has a way stricter lockdown than here because i do see books coming out in america um, one of my friends books just appeared at target so uh, it is different and this is being uh, coming out of india so i'll i'll let you know you can watch bloomsbury india's page as well for that um well one of the things i was asked to talk about was were there any challenges and i think that comes back to vika's question also a little bit um i 
don't find writing challenging at all because I've been doing it for so long. In fact, I find not being able to write very challenging and I get very antsy if I'm unable to write or paint or something. Um, the only problem has been writing around children. Um, although my, my child is very calm and very cooperative, but he insists on editing and correcting my mistakes what he thinks are mistakes which are proper spellings but he thinks they are wrong and he so he, he really loves to be a part of the process so um that i think was my only challenge it's always a challenge to write uh, anything uh, like that with a very enthusiastic and a loving seven-year-old who loves books and really wants to participate even if they are not children's books so yeah it's a mixed blessing and um yeah let me see any other questions Okay, so um, one of the other things I was um, was to talk about was in this quarantine period, um, how does it affect creative people? Uh, personally, I think it's a huge gift for all of us and everybody's creative. Uh, we are always creating, it is impossible not to. Um, I think we have learned a lot. We, the privileged ones during this self-isolation, um, we have learned that we need to make do with very less. We really don't need much. Uh, and uh, we have managed to give Mother Earth a breather. We have uh, increased appreciation for the little things, which is something that's so inherent to kids and we found in ourselves. And those are some of the epiphanies that I see coming up as a collective uh, to people in isolation everywhere. And I'm sure if all of us uh, are more present with ourselves, then there'll be a lot more epiphanies coming up. Um, my only urge would be to not force yourself to be productive, to be as kind to yourself as possible during this quarantine period. To um, It's okay to not get, get things done. It's so hard, especially with distance learning of those who have children. I think that uh, definitely making it harder. Uh, but uh, yeah, just be kind to yourself. Take it a minute at a time. Take uh, Use this life to create. And I don't just mean write, paint. Use this time to create uh, the life that you want. What is working? What isn't working? It's, uh, it's like winning the jackpot in terms of having time for self-introspection. Um, and that is the biggest gift we can give to ourselves is the gift of presence. Uh, which is w what I was answering, uh, I think, to Vika's question before and also to Rachna's. Um, yeah, to just be, to let's use this quarantine time to be kinder, to be more present so we know what we want to create. Um, my own creative pursuits have actually really <laughs> gone down, but I'm getting to read a lot. I am reading uh, Ocean Vong, one of my favorite um Poets, his first novel right now is going pretty slow because so many demands. Um, but yeah, like I said, let's be kind to ourselves and uh, give ourselves the gift of presence. Remember uh, to take care of our mental health first. Uh, there is no difference between the mind and the body. We take care of mental health, the physical will automatically follow. Um, so that's my parting words for quarantine. Stay safe and take care and thank you so much again for uh, joining me. I hope you like The Water Phoenix and I hope you will uh, read it and when it comes out. Thank you. Bye-bye.